Welcome back to IGN's History of Awesome, a year-by-year -year breakdown of the most important movies, TV shows, and video games that shape pop culture. In 1995, PlayStation found its first mascot in Crash Bandicoot. The original Toy Story arrived in theaters, and Brad Pitt wondered what's in the box. Mel Gibson was yelling about freedom, and Japan introduced us to Ghost in the Shell. Let's take a look at everything awesome that happened in 1995. Welcome back, everybody, once again to History of Awesome. This year, we're talking about 1995, which I personally believe is, is my favorite year. Yeah. I had a great time that year. I'm Max Scoville, for those of you unfamiliar. This is Vince Ingenio, Megan Sullivan, and Jared Petty, who are all very nice enough to join me and talk about such exciting things as Windows 95. Yeah, one of the favorite <laughs> games of all time. <laughs> and, uh, a lot, of, a lot of video game stuff happened that year. Uh, big one, first E3, the Oops. PlayStation launch, the Sega, Sega Saturn launch. We were kind of seeing a sort of beautiful tail end to 16-bit JRPGs. Uh, a lot of great movies. Uh, let's let's start with the first E3. Yeah. Uh, that was kind of a dramatic time. Um, Vince, why don't you start us off? Do you know Do you know the details about this one? Well, so this is like the this is the big CD showdown, you know, mm -hmm. like and, and the introduction of CD technology to the video game industry is like absolutely massive it, it, it's like a like an order of magnitude change in like what we can do and of course what do people do when they have that much technology they abuse it in horribly funny ways so <laughs> it was a it, it was it was basically like um it was the first time we saw the two like really square off uh, in that sense and start to show like what those things can do beyond like what we'd already seen, which was, you know, we, we'd seen some full motion video stuff and things like that. But this is the first time where in like the, the larger gaming world we're seeing like more potential uh, beyond that. Yeah, it was a really weird show. You know, you, you've got the you've got the PlayStation and the Saturn there, but you've also got the 3DO yeah. at the tail end of its life, the Jaguar by Atari, oh and the Virtual Boy there uh, at the same time. But really, it's all about Sony and Sega, and Sega decides to shock the world. They come out one morning for their, their big E3 press conference. Sega Saturn, it's amazing, it's CD-based, it's awesome, it's coming. As a matter of fact, it's here right now in <laughs> stores for three hundred and ninety nine dollars. You With can walk out and buy it. A big messy asterisk there. It is in some stores. Right, in some and stores. The right. Thing is, when you do that, all the other stores get really mad, mm -hmm. and so do all of the developers and publishers who weren't aware of this. <laughs> yeah. So there's a bunch of games that are supposed to come out in the holiday season that they thought were going to be launch titles are coming out with this brand new system. And they're like. What? Yeah, it's literally it's literally a stealth launch, yeah. and uh, they didn't think about the way this would affect their partnerships, but they also didn't think about the way it would affect the consumer. Like, so I was an avid video game, you know, buyer and player, um, but for me as a kid, I needed to save up my money for something. So I wanted a Sega Saturn. I really did want a Sega Saturn, but I was walking by an EB in in my local mall with my father, and there it was. In yep. in the in the in the window, and I was like, "That's that's not supposed to be my I, my allowance isn't saved up enough yeah. for this." That's and so, fair. like, I didn't get a I didn't yeah. get a Saturn. They, they they had I think good intentions, uh, but they, they 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 screwed things up for a lot of consumers. They really screwed things up with retailers. They cut Walmart out for crying out loud uh, at a time when that was that was everything. Sure. And um, more than that, they had already done several really dumb things before this. You know, we had 32x. We had them killing the Genesis way too early. They, they had done a lot of things to tick off retailers and, and consumers. And this was just kind of icing on the cake. Plus. Sony comes along the same afternoon and does something absolutely amazing. Yes. You guys, you know the story? Yes. Yeah. It's it's pretty amazing. So you're like, oh, this amazing system has just been unveiled. It's for three ninety nine. It looks amazing. It's you know it's already in some stores. And then Sony just basically drops a pipe bomb and it's like, oh, we have a system too. And you know what? It's what was it? Two ninety nine. Yeah, they just walk up with a big ream of papers in the middle of their their presentation. This guy's like, we'd like to introduce the president of that other. And he walks up and he like does this with him. You're waiting for this. They've been doing like this really boring PowerPoint before this, <laughs> and he looks at it and he just goes two ninety nine and walks over. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, it was. Um very similar to kind of what Sony did with the, yeah, the PS4. Yeah, a couple years ago with PS4. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they they had the shots kind of lined up for him there. They just sort of were, they were just they were just batting. Uh, I like this. Prominent E3 was Polygon Man, Sony's soon to be abandoned 3D mascot. Oh, it was yeah. a thing. It was so creepy. He really I remember just a lot of that kind of that just the the pol the Polygon Men aesthetic. Like there was the there was the Game Genie mascot, man, that wasn't 95, but around that time there was a lot of that like we figured out how to sort of make something in 3D. 
Let's put it on stuff. Yeah. <laughs> what could go wrong? It's kind of like the lawnmower man with less detail. He, he, sort, of, he sort of looked like Johnny Mnemonic Darth Maul. Uh, That's, that is correct. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we also the games for for the for the PlayStation. Well, oh, this, this is the big games of E3. I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong list. Battle Arena Toshinden. Ah, Ridge Racer. Oh. Ridge uh, Racer. Oh, right then. Uh, when Nature Calls also came out that year, so that works. Um, <laughs> uh, Virtual Fighter, Killer Instinct, Donkey Kong Country 2, Donkey Kong Land, and Earthbound were all kind of the, the those were the games of the year, but at that point nobody was doing that at E3 because it had just started. It was right. Right. <laughs> kind of weird little trade show. I love watching videos from that because there was like, there wasn't really video coverage. It's done on like camcorders and mm -hmm. stuff. And the the uh, press conference that Sony gave was like, it's, it's in like a, like, like when you see like, Best propane salesman in northern Texas. Like we're, we rented out a hotel lobby. It was in yeah. like a hotel dining room, and it's just <laughs> yeah. it's weird to see how far it's grown since then. Uh, obviously, Sega Saturn. Uh, we talked about that a little bit. I um, love, I, I, and I do love the Saturn. I have a lot of a lot of love in my heart for the Saturn. Um, I yeah, love. You're a big apologist of that <laughs> thing. I don't think I'm an apologist. Because the Sega Saturn is not something you need to apologize for. Oh! oh, oh my. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it does have a special place in my heart because of uh, you know the, uh, the sweet RAM card expansion that it uh, that it had. And oh yeah, the, that cartridge port you could you could add RAM to it. But loving the Saturn is like loving Frankenstein. Yeah. Uh, because it is a Frankensteinian oh, Frankenstein. monstrosity. Yeah, it was it was grafted together. At the, the last second they realized what the PlayStation was going to be, and they're like, "We built this great 2D machine, and it's not nearly as good at 3D." And they they stuck another like daughter card in there and kind of duct taped it together with the result that if you wanted to, to do anything with the sucker, you had to write an assembly code and lasso coprocessors together, whereupon the PlayStation was pretty easy to develop for. So the machine itself was, was an overpriced, underpowered nightmare. Well, the thing with the but the thing is that the the PlayStation then was the was actually the kind of the reverse. Like it was natively, it did 3D, you know, very well relative to the times. But you actually had to do a fair bit of wrangling and 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 creative thinking to get it to do 2D really well. Yeah. So like all the all the 2D fighters that I was super into, like the place to play those was on a Japanese uh, a Japanese Saturn yep. with a four meg RAM cart, and that was like the way to experience it. Well, that's it. There was such a great software library. The the hardware was awful, and despite that. There were just just bukus of wonderful games. So it was an yeah. importer's paradise, but we got some good good games on this side okay. of the pond as well. You dropped a ticked off, and now bukus. You are really committing to the nineties. I am committing <laughs> to the nineties. Now you actually uh, you lived in Japan for a while. Yeah, and you you have stories about collecting Sega Saturn. Collecting Sega Saturn in Japan when I lived there was was just a singular delight because with the ex with uh, a few very expensive discs aside, it's cheap. You can go to thrift stores and just find mounds of Saturn games for 100 yen each. And so I, I bought a Saturn for in a box for a dollar um, with that excellent Japanese controller, brought it home, and then I had like my bom Bomberman, two Bomberman multi-taps <laughs> put together for 10 player Saturn yep. Bomberman. And I'm buying these discs for a buck a piece and discovering all these amazing games I never knew existed and these wonderful compilations and these incredible 2D fighters and these great shooters. So many good shooters on the Saturn. And then yeah, I did go out and you know, drop the 150 for Radiant Silver Gun, and, and, which was oh, worth every radiant. penny. Me, me, uh, me and my, so I got that. I, I got that burned. I'm, I hate to confess it, but like this is this is during the height of of like kind of pirating, you know, game pirating. Um, and I didn't have any conception of how it was bad or anything. So I just I would get I would buy stacks of games, and you know they didn't have real labels. It would just like be like a sticky a sticky note to the front of it, and uh, and I, I put a sticky note on front of that, and it, it, I still have it. I still have this mm -hmm. it, the the sleeve with the sticky note, radiant silver, and then I put in big capitals, God, <laughs> not God, but God, because the game was so godlike that I was just like I had to do it. Little little young me, treasure's finest hour. Yeah, uh, but yeah, the Saturn really uh, Max, it, it was incredible, and it's a great system, or it was as of a few years ago. I can't speak now, great system to collect for uh, because there's just reams of, of spare software laying around hmm. where people, it did really well in Japan. Uh, mm. And so people eventually sold their collections off and there's just a surplus of good Saturn games there. Okay, uh, so if you've got a garage that's looking kind of empty, just want to fill it up with something. Yeah. Uh, then of course the, the PlayStation, which was clearly the, the victor, you know, yes. it was, it was, we're still here. <laughs> um, that that had a, that had a little, little feller, a fellow named Crash Bandicoot, yes, who was a... Uh, I love Crash so much. Uh, that that game is a, uh, to me, uh, that game is a severely, in the grand scheme of things, underrated uh, mascot platformer. I think uh, over the years people have kind of discounted it and kind of looked down on it. 
but uh, especially Crash 2, uh, both visually and mechanically. Um, I mean, it was definitely slower and a little bit more uh, clumsy and ungainly than, uh, than say, Mario was. Mm-hmm. Um, but I feel like as far as like an introduction to 3D platforming, so like Mario 64 did 3D platforming, but I never felt like I really knew where I was jumping or where I was going Ooh. in let's, Mario 64. What? Let's back up for a second. We're yeah. talking about Mario in, 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 in a PlayStation conversation. The, my, probably my favorite piece of information here is that PlayStation began as a Nintendo yes. product. Absolutely. Like uh, so, you know, Sony and Nintendo were working together, were collaborating on making a new, uh, making a new system. And uh, at the end of the day, they couldn't get on the same page about what the primary medium should be. And Nintendo was uh, was very, very uh, married to the idea of staying with a cartridge because of the lack of load times there because, you know, a CD-ROM was going to mean loading times between levels and, you know, they they wanted the experience to be quick and speedy and they didn't want people to have to wait. And uh, Sony was like, yeah, but there's all these limitations when you're working with a co- with a cartridge and there's c- high costs involved as well. CD is cheaper and gives you more possibilities. Philosophically, they couldn't marry those two ideas together and so they parted ways and Sony just took what, what they had worked on and just kept running with it. I'd like to piggyback on what you said about the sure. CDs there. That, that's part of what makes the PlayStation generation so great. Mm-hmm. That media was so cheap to develop for and, and produce. And Sony helped uh, invent it. That was a, the, the CD-ROM was kind of invented by, was it Philips and Sony, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. Philips and Sony, and, and uh, I, I don't know the deep history of this, but it was a collaborative effort yeah. across several hardware manufacturers. But yeah, it was easy to make the medium. And the PlayStation was deliberately easy to develop for relative to other consoles that had come before. So it was really easy to fool around with the thing and just try stuff. And that led to this immense variety of software. And it created a market situation where people who couldn't have afforded maybe to develop games of a certain kind before could suddenly sell them in small runs and still make a profit. And it created a very fertile marketplace. The price of video games actually kind of went down so for a low, while. So yeah. low at also, that time. Also, a big part of that was the fact that Sony had experience selling CDs, which were a new a new medium for, or you know, a new, a new format for, for music. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They were good at kind of approaching artists. They had the whole, you know, Sony mm-hmm. music. And that actually was kind of repurposed to be Sony Computer Entertainment. Like they were, mm-hmm. they had people who were able to go and talk to, you know, artist type people versus just talking to business software or, you know, treating it like, you know, Sony up until that point was, they were a consumer electronics company, not a software company. And they kind of followed that through with the industrial design for the PlayStation. You can see the shades of the of the Famicom, the Japanese Nintendo there. Oh, absolutely, there. you can. But the final design looks more like something that should be next to your television mm-hmm. on your 1995 shelf, you know, b- below your, like, uh, hi-fi VCR sure. or which, whatever you have. Which makes yeah. sense. And it was a CD player. It yeah. had RCA out. Like, yeah. it had really, and you could do cool visualizations on there. And that was, like... That was a time when not everyone had CD players already. So, right. And this is the beginning, and you're, you're absolutely right, not everyone had a CD player, and this is kind of the beginning, in a lot of ways, of what will become not just a video game console war, it will become a war for the living room. And it yeah. starts here with the PlayStation being not just a device that plays games, but a device that plays other, other forms of media. Now, stepping back a bit to the more cartridge-driven 2D stuff, a um, couple favorites of all time for a lot of people, uh, Chrono Trigger and Earthbound oh, both oh came out in 95. They're extraordinarily special games. Well, yeah. Go nuts! Have yeah. at it! Now, uh, Chrono Trigger has a very, very uh, special place in my heart because it's the... It's, first of all, um, everyone knows that I'm very, uh, very mechanics-oriented and, and, man... So Chrono Trigger solved so many problems with JRPGs. Like I love, I love grindy JRPGs as much as the next person. But everyone, almost everyone, agrees like random encounters are no fun. You know, only because there's no input from the player. So they're like, okay, it's fine. We're still gonna have encounters uh, on the field like this, but you're gonna have the opportunity to kind of preemptively see that and make some kind of a choice about whether or not you want to engage in them or try to avoid them in some way. So it turned what is ordinarily something that's completely out of the player's hands into another form of gameplay. And um, that was a big thing that separated it. But the, uh, the artwork from Akira Toriyama, mm-hmm. um, just I, iconic is probably an overword, overused word these days, but, but uh, the silhouette of, say, like Frog or Chrono um, or Robo, like all of them, like so... So many, uh, a Gato, even Gato, I love Gato's <laughs> robot. Um, yeah, and the soundtrack is just like unbelievable. Someone did a, a great crossover of like um, of, uh, of Jay Z tracks and uh, and the sound and the Chrono Trigger soundtrack that I listen to. I actually listen to it daily. And you can't. What's amazing about those about that era's music, but particularly the Chrono Trigger soundtrack, is that you can put it in other musical contexts, and it becomes actually difficult to tell where the melodies and harmonies from uh, from the Chrono Trigger stuff. 
end and where the other music that it's been surrounded by begins because it was that sophisticated in terms of how it was uh, it was um, um, conducted. But it's also the storytelling, right? I mean, it had so many iconic moments. I almost want to say spoiler alert because I'm so sensitive to spoilers. It's been spoiler years. Years. Yeah. So I still I just, get goosebumps when I hear that theme. Yeah, I mean, I actually, when you hear that ticking clock, by the way, in the very beginning <gasps> of the theme, I get teary-eyed. Me too. Mm-hmm. Every single time. I'm going to do it right now. But, you know, there were so many iconic moments. So, I mean, basically, this was before there was Aerith. There was that scene with Chrono. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. was, that was like, ugh, right in the field. Because that didn't happen in, in many no. games. It's like, What? Yeah, and, you can't and, kill off the main character. Uh, yeah, it's like, <laughs> holy cow. And yeah, what you said about Magus and that twist, the fact that, that you know, here's who you think's the big bad for most of the game, and he ends up, is like, joins your party? If yeah, you spare, and you're if, like, you, if you let him. If you let him, and then, but he doesn't really, like, he actually kind of hates you still, yeah, he so he won't does. cooperate with you entirely, like the combo attacks, you have to equip the special item, you know, just do that. And talking about that, this is a game that I, I think part of what makes Chrono Trigger still good. Uh, Chrono Trigger is still very playable. Um, it's still excellent. A lot of restraint on the developer's part. They didn't try to do everything. It's a yeah. very streamlined, minimized system. It's just perfectly tuned and gives you just enough options to have some control over how the battles are unfolding, but not so many that you're drowning. It's very friendly to beginners, but it's also deep enough to satisfy longtime RPG players. That's probably why we're still talking about it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I also want to point out, like, yeah, Kira Toriyama kind of, depending on where you live, household name, I mean, creator of Dragon Ball Z, sure. which blew the hell up a few years later, uh, anime hadn't popped yet stateside. It was no. still kind of this bad corner thing in in the West, so... It's right there, it's close, but it's it not there. So and so many people's yeah. first exposure to that kind of big eye, spiky hair aesthetic mm-hmm. was stuff like Chrono yes. Trigger. And yeah. I mean, I remember, I remember like my friends and I just drawing stuff that we didn't know where it came from, but it was kind of like, it was kind of tied to that. <laughs> Toriyama's one of my favorite artists, and it's just... It's kind of funny to, to realize, oh yeah, like the, the the first exposure was, it wasn't Dragon Ball, it was it was Chrono Trigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then can I say that the battle animation, like the animation in the game, is amazing. Yeah, the, like there was nothing else like it at the time. Like this thing really pushed that whole sixteen bit era, like right to the brink. Yeah, the t- and the team up attacks looked so visual. amazing. All that frog, exactly. dro- that the giant yeah, holographic the frog. frog, yep. frog yeah. But then you have Earthbound, which is a very different game, but also a wonderful RPG. Uh, and it, it, much like Chrono Trigger, it, it minimizes what's there. You know, it's like no random battles. The, the systems are fairly simple, but it's a less is more type scenario. You need to go out, you see the enemies on the map, and then when you're powerful enough, they run away from you. It had that brilliant thing it did where if you took a fatal hit, you st- your life starts to count down, and you've got enough time to still win the battle and squeak one out at the last second. And that the marvelous soundtrack, simply beautiful game, uh, uh, the- terribly marketed, just awfully marketed. Yeah, yeah no one I knew what that game was. Marketing was pretty bad in general in the mm-hmm. mid '90s. The fun fact: that's the year the X Games came out too. Oh. <laughs> um, what was how was Earthbound presented? Uh, Earthbound was presented as a game about there. They had these scratch and sniff things, and it was pretty much like. Like flatulence and and uh, and lowbrow humor, they were they were trying to push it as sort of a, uh, a, a me myself and Irene the video game. Mm. I don't think that movie had actually come out <laughs> yet, but you get the idea. That was kind of the thrust. It's like it's extreme and it's bad and there's boogers. They're kind of going for a Nick Cage sort of thing. Yeah, right. exactly. And that's not what Earthbound is. Sweet and nostalgic and and adorable and and, and, and completely unmarketable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. yeah, not yeah. A, not a not a good thing in the '90s. Really, it was all about wraparound shades and people yelling at you. While jumping out of planes, <laughs> yeah, it just uh, didn't work. On a similar note, we also got Super Mario World Two: Yoshi's Island, which uh, one of my one of my favorite games ever. Like I, I kind of think back to, to '95, and it was it was the, I think it was the year I discovered Doom. It was a lot of kind of just it, that that beginning of sort of being very sort of a preteen aggro about stuff and wanting things to be cool. Yoshi's Island is a, is a, a, a literal baby game. It is a game about babysitting. <laughs> it is simultaneously a game that is entirely escort missions, and it is a prequel, and in spite of that, it works. Yeah. You know, you're Yoshi, and everything's just like cutesy, colorful, you know, picture book looking thing, and it's just, it's just the most charming game in the world. And you, you were talking about that picture book thing. I mean, I, I love the story of how it ended yeah. up that way. I mean, you, well, you were so, talking about this earlier. Yeah, I mean, I, apparently things were trying to be a little bit a little bit cool and, and futuristic and aggro even in, in Japan because Nintendo higher-ups were saying that this should look like Donkey Kong Country. That's mm-hmm. where people want their games to be. They want that pre-rendered 3D. Uh, and I guess Miyamoto was like, mm, no, no, no. They were like, this. whatever early version you showed them looked too much like uh, the first Super Mario World. So he came back and he's like, everything's made out of cut-out paper. Deal with it. You know? <laughs> yeah. 
I pray pause. It's really incredible restraint there. They use the Super FX chip in that, or the Super FX2 chip, pardon me, and yet they, they barely use it, and so the very few moments they, they Yeah, it, it actually never has knew. those effects in there, but they're so subtle, they exercise, again, such great restraint that it just ends up looking, it pops out and looks good when they use it, and then they don't touch on it again. Because in every other Super FX game, it's literally just like, that is the, gra that is, that's all that it is, it's just a bunch of polygons, like in a mess, like, you know, it's a, the original Star Fox and um, what was that racing game? I can't remember. Uh, Star Race was. FX. Yeah, Star yeah. Race FX. Mm -hmm. You know, literally just looked like, hey, I was made of blocks. I didn't. I never would have guessed that Yoshi's Island was was used with that chip. Yeah, it's the FX two. Yeah, it's really really subtly done. But what a beautiful game. Yeah, it's such so fantastic. So a lot of games stuff to talk about. Uh, also a lot of other stuff. One thing that uh, inspired a lot of game developers was Toy Story, which was the three D movie that changed everything. Mm -hmm. This was Pixar's first feature film. Uh, this was, I believe, the first, I think maybe the only animated feature to get nominated for a screenplay, original or otherwise. Uh, yeah. Well, it's time, anyway, yeah. Toy Story stands out, I think, because it, unlike a lot of uh, 3D movies that have come since that use high-profile actors, Tom Hanks and Tim Allen are playing characters. They're not... Tom Hanks and Tim Allen first. They are Woody the Cowboy and Buzz Lightyear, and those people are not the actors portraying them. A, a lot of times people kind of play themselves in movies now. In Toy Story, those personalities are distinct and wonderful, and they teach you that it's okay to fall with style. They, they go do amazing things. That movie's funny, it's good if you're young, it's good if you're old. I hated the idea of 3D <laughs> animated movies. Uh, I was dragged to see Toy Story, uh, kicking and screaming I against my will. I have no trouble imagining you in 1995 being like, mm-mm. No, <laughs> no, 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 And I walked out of that theater like, that That might be the best cartoon I've ever seen. I think uh, I was in the same place as you uh, with Toy Story, not only Toy Story, but with Yoshi's Island, actually, where I was like, I was just old enough to, fe I was just getting old enough to be like, I'm too cool for that. Yeah. Like, I was just getting to that age where I, where I was like, no, that's for kids. I'm too cool for that, and so I totally did not give it a a, a fair shot. A funny thing about about Toy Story for me is that when I originally saw it when I was younger, I was so wrapped up in that persona, I was like, eh, it's fine, whatever. And then as an adult, when I watched it, that's when it. Yeah, came. just reading up on it, I want to go home and watch it. Yeah, like, this yeah. Is, me too. Um, one fun piece of information I found is is Billy Crystal was originally up for Tom Hanks's role as Woody. Mm. Oh, uh, and I guess he turned it down, and has had said publicly that that was the biggest mistake of his career, <laughs> and. You know they still they still liked him, and when John Lasseter called him up uh, to offer him the role for for Monsters Monster Inc., Inc. Uh, he got his wife on the phone and he says, you know, hi, this is John Lasseter, uh, and she goes, uh, Billy, it's John Lasseter on the phone. And he just picks up the phone. And goes, yes. So he just he just <laughs> he just really wanted that's to get in there. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really really cool. I uh, I also think we'd be remiss not mentioning just for a second the claw, um, which is. A claw. Yeah, a claw. I, that's where they got me. The idea of the little aliens in the in the UFO catcher living in like a cultic reality where they worship this big silvery claw over them. That's <laughs> that's great comedy. Right there. So let's uh, totally shift gears recklessly. Let's talk about seven. Oh yeah, oh. yeah. That was a total tone shift right there. Yeah. From Toy Story to seven. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think people would have guessed that the guy who made Alien Three, especially at the time <laughs> before the director's cut, because I mean, okay, like I'll totally admit the th theatrical Alien Three kind of a disaster. I, kind I, of. <laughs> but I, I like the director's cut of it, but no one would have thought that 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 person who directed that would go on to to do what Seven did. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, he, like a lot of a, a lot of great directors, he started with commercials and music videos. Sure. Um, and this was his second feature film. Uh, and it was also the first foray into what I think is kind of David Fincher's forte, which is just murder and crime and serial mm -hmm. killer stuff. He's since done The Game and Zodiac and Gone Girl and Panic Room and Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, most of which get pretty grisly. Mm -hmm. And Seven still manages to top all of them, I oh, think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Kevin Spacey's 10 minutes or so of screen time in Seven might be Kevin Spacey's 10 me best minutes of screen time in anything ever. He he's extraordinary, because this is a mystery movie where they don't solve the mystery. They're working on it. They're working on it. They're following all the clues. Of it. And then he just walks in covered in blood. And it's like, hi, guys. You know, uh, <laughs> that, that's, uh, it, and it's, then well, throws it in Brad Pitt's face. Exactly. If you've never it's seen it. And the ending. Sorry. Uh, it's a great movie, though. That's, um, I, yeah, I, I just, it. I love how, you know, you watch something like Silence of the Lambs, which is like fairly grounded, mm -hmm. uh, sort of tries to take place in, in real world. Seven is like a, is a, like a almost, almost cartoony in terms of how mm -hmm. grisly it is. It is just, it's, you know, symbolic, and it's one of those things where there's like this is, it's got this 
hyper stylized world they're in where they go from like just rainy inner city to just desolate desert landscape. Mm -hmm. I love that. It's fantastic. Can we take a moment though, because we always talk about Kevin Spacey in this movie, because it is like one of his best performances ever, but I'm always mesmerized by Morgan Freeman and his acting. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's that scene in the bar where he and Brad Pitt's character, who I keep forgetting their names, but there's just, there's this cynicism that Morgan Freeman's character Mm -hmm. has and you, you just believe it. Like every line he delivers, it's just, you never see him acting. You always see him just- Ernest Hemingway once said, the world is a wonderful place <laughs> we're fighting for. <laughs> I agree with the second part. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, he's, he's, he's great. Yeah. Um, also, that was when Brad Pitt was still kind of in that weird pretty boy phase. Yeah. yeah. People so weren't trying really to break out of it. Trying, trying to so hard. Yeah. And he yeah. still kind of is, I feel like. <laughs> this, this he goes back and was forth. Was this before and... 12 Monkeys or after? Because I don't 12 remember. Monkeys to me is one of his better performances. Uh, 12 Monkeys actually came out in 1995. So oh, okay, there you go. Yeah. So I always remember that being my favorite Brad Pitt so, movie. So, I, I get a weird confession. I love Terry Gilliam. I love. Oh, yeah. Dystopian sci-fi. Uh, I don't know if I've ever finished Twelve Monkeys because mm. <laughs> that movie is so aggressively bleak going in. I've seen bits and pieces of it a number of times, but let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. I saw it one point five times because the lights went out in the movie theater in the middle of the movie, oh. doing this like climactic cliffhanger. It's like what? That's a bad movie for that to happen. Yeah, it's me? a really bad movie for that to happen. And so I saw it one point five times in the theater, and it was it was intense. I mean, it was really crazy with the whole time loop thing and was this always supposed to happen and had, oh it's so well set up. And I love Bruce Willis in that movie so. I keep forgetting Bruce Willis was in that movie. I actually didn't didn't get to, I was in the same boat with you where like I found, it wasn't so much the bleakness of it but there was something about the, uh, I guess the subtext of the thematic that I just, I couldn't wrap my, quite wrap my brain, that, like that me, that young me, like it's like the kind of movie I should be paying attention to for again this idea I had in my head of like. I'm becoming a man now. Rah. I should watch <laughs> manly movies like Twelve Monkeys, which is apparently a manly movie. No, but um, but yeah, I, I couldn't quite wrap my brain around the thematics at that time. But uh, I, I've never actually returned to it. I think I should. Yeah, it no, is. I mean, it's really good. It uh, explains it all at the end, and it's this really nice Terry, callback to something at the beginning. Terry Gilliam's a is a, a tough director to just sit down and watch. You, you really <laughs> have to you have to have a cup of coffee first. <laughs> uh, now speaking of Bruce Willis, I'm going to bring this up. I'm going off book here. Die Hard with a Vengeance. Oh. oh my god! Yeah. Oh, this autumn. Holy Zeus. Yeah. Uh, how do you how do you make a, a good Die Hard sequel? Well, you make it out of something that wasn't a Die Hard movie. Mm-hmm. You repurpose some <laughs> other script and you throw John McClane in there with a hangover and you add Samuel L. Jackson, who was just at his prime between ninety four and ninety five. Yeah. yeah. What he's, do you guys think? He's ang- he's he's angry as hell. Um, I don't know the, the this John McClane. Is the I think this is the beginning of, of like where he becomes a folk hero and not just like a he becomes a legend I think mm-hmm. here not not so much because the movie is so good but because I think it's like that you're not actually a legend until you've lived until you've stayed around long enough for for the movies to start getting bad but they keep making them anyway <laughs> I and like I don't think that Hope the Vengeance is necessarily the greatest uh, the think, greatest of the bunch I think it's it's a pretty it's a pretty good action movie. I think it's the only other good Die Hard movie. Yeah, I would, uh, I would totally Besides Die Hard. one. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, kind of, it breaks that formula. A lot of people think that Die Hard has to be set in like one specific location and yeah. with a vengeance is all over the place. It's I, Yeah, I appreciate its discipline. I mean, it, it, it starts right off with Summer in the City. You've got that great and then boom, something blows up and suddenly they're grabbing John McClane and suddenly he's naked with with a, oh, a yeah, racist he's stuck epitaph in around it and and Sam Jackson is angry and they're there and they're running off and it just goes and it is a, a very solid action movie script. I, I don't know the details of how it became Die Hard. I, I know that it was not intended to be that way, but I would like to know what genius looked at that and said, you know what this needs? John McClane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it's it's um, good repurposing. Agree. Um, now we talked about anime for a second, teeny tiny bit. Um, Ghost in the Shell yes. dropped in 1995. Huge milestone yeah. for anime. Anime, anime, member, anime club member, would you like to lead us off on this one? Oh man, so where do I start? I mean, I was, I was re-watching it yesterday because it gave me the perfect excuse to do so. And it is, and I watched the original. There's like a 2.0 version. Don't watch it. Don't watch it. Don't. That's not the one. Nope. And so go watch the 1995 version. And it's just, it's very abstract. It's very esoteric. It's very, it's just very heavy. And you've never seen, like for American audiences, we hadn't seen animation that was that, that deep and that violent. Mm-hmm. And, Kira. Uh, yeah, I mean, besides, but I should was, say besides Akira. That was like just kind of getting, yeah, still getting passed around. That was sci-fi, on. where this is very, I mean, 
some people, I think, balked originally because they f found it very pretentious, but it's, it's actually very deep and sets it up really well. It's got great direction. It does this high wire act of, you know, it's cop drama, but it's also questioning our, our very being, our very yeah. essence. What is the human soul? That's heavy stuff. Well, cyberpunk gets kind of a, kind of a, a bum deal on, on the big screen, and Ghost in the Shell is one of the, kind of the few instances that really, really does it right, and it mm -hmm. draws very heavily from Blade Runner, which is another one of the instances. Right. Uh, it also kind of is a proper visual interpretation of a lot of stuff introduced in uh, William Gibson's, um, you know, Neuromancer right. and, and following books. Um, just cybernetic implants being kind of ubiquitous and the idea of there being, you know, self-aware AI out there. Uh, and then it just throw in, throws in action cop stuff, which is lots of fun. Of course, this was a huge influence to The Matrix. Yes. Which... I think The Matrix is almost an effort to parse Ghost in the Shell for a larger audience. Yeah. I, I mean, that's, that's really kind of what you get there. Real life action-driven thing that, that takes some of the thematic material. But what's nice about Ghost in the Shell is that there's that sense of melancholy that the Matrix pretty much lacks the mm -hmm. most of it. it, it the Ghost in the Shell really does kind of kind of grab you there at the end. Yeah, and, it's, uh, it's very, I don't want to say dark, but I mean, it, it does, it, especially when they're having that battle with the tank and they're in the natural museum, you know, yeah. the natural history museum, and you start to, you know, wonder, I mean, the, the characters are all basically robots at this point. There's very little human left in them. Mm -hmm. But does that matter? Yeah, it's, but does that matter? Is it, you know, it's getting to the point now where actually it's pretty topical. I just got the latest Economist, and it's all about we've got genetics down so much that there's this thing called CRISPR. I forget what the acronym, uh, what each letter stands for, but it's, it's all about you can go in your DNA and you can now essentially change it. You can co copy, paste, cut, paste. I mean, we're getting to that point, and, and then you start your to wonder. Character. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, yeah, you can basically be, be whatever you want. You can actually have all sorts of enhancements, and all you can get rid of all sorts of genetic defects and stuff like that. But you start to wonder, but what happens to you as a person? In 2025, when the robots are our masters, this clip right here of you speaking <laughs> is going to be the beginning of the I movie come that back describes in time that. to warn you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, um, going the other direction, Braveheart. That was Mel Gibson's second time directing a movie. Uh, historical movie. Oh, <laughs> uh, it took some liberties. I was reading about this. Uh, the screenwriter, whose name I don't have in front of me, apparently went on a tour of Scotland and was inspired by these statues of William Wallace and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And asked the tour guide, who's that guy? And the guy told him, and he was like, oh, this is an amazing story. And <laughs> before doing any research, he wrote the script and then kind of went back and added <laughs> stuff after the fact because he really just wanted to just tell a story and I think that's great I, I love historical fiction I, I enjoy getting some history out of my movies but I also like sometimes just a great yarn and Braveheart is a superb yarn and a superbly directed yarn uh, um, the battle scenes in Braveheart there just hadn't been anything like that kind of mass scale ultraviolet action sequence to proceed in. Mm -hmm. it was in that scene where they've got the spears at their feet and the and the charging cavalry can't yeah. see them and he's just telling them to hold and he's just telling them to wait. And you're like, what is he doing? Because the audience doesn't really know what's going on at that point either. So it's like terrifying. Yeah. Uh, and then when they, and then when they just impale all these horses, right. that's like probably the only time in my life I've ever cheered for horses being impaled, actually. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's goofy in places. I mean. Yeah, well, it's it's funny because it uh, draws really heavily from uh, George Miller's directing style because that's like, I mean, Mel Gibson learned how to direct by hanging out and being in movies and watching director's work. And a lot of the, he, sa he said before, a lot of the stunts in Braveheart were inspired by Mad Max's crazy battle sequences. He just was. So it all comes full circle. Yeah, He's got much. Mad Max in the movie. Exactly. And apparently yeah. he, he couldn't direct unless he was actually the star as well, I heard. Yeah, basically uh, because he didn't have enough clout kind of directorially, they weren't sure I was going to perform, and this is this massive historical epic. They're like, you can make this movie if you're in this movie, because then we can say it's a Mel Gibson movie, and then, you know, people will go see it as opposed to. You know, some yeah, and I think the cool thing is that even though it was not at all historically accurate, I mean, there was no bridge at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. I mean, where's the bridge? But I think it's like 300. If you went into 300 expecting Herodotus play-by-play, -play, I don't know <laughs> what to tell you. <laughs> so, I mean, it's one of those things where as soon as you saw it, it was Mel Gibson starring as William Wallace, who, according to legend, was like, you know, somewhere between six or five and seven feet tall, and, you know, it was just very seasoned warrior and... I just what you shoot you fireballs <laughs> from his eyes and lightning bolts from his ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was that, is, that, is that what the quote was? Very yeah. close but to I, that. I like yeah. the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Like you probably noticed that uh, I don't fit the description. But, <laughs> but that's okay. I watched that movie pretty recently, and there's a lot of 
there's a specific kind of style of of schmaltz that exists in mid '90s <laughs> movies, yeah. and there's some like really just like like borderline R and B video levels of just like. Just, just Mel Gibson being like extra dreamy and just kind of like smoldering. <laughs> and like, and um, you, you have to yeah. love the French queen and him have an affair because reasons. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's apparently the father of Edward the Third. Yes, now, third, now, pardon people, me, Edward the Third. Yeah. Yeah. When people are like, oh, Hollywood, I mean, they're kind of pointing at movies like this very specifically. But, but then, I mean, Mel Gibson is also kind of like, he's sort of gone off and done his own thing a little bit too. You know, <laughs> he did not star in Passion of the Christ because I don't think studios gave him money for that and Apocalypto, I don't know what he did with that one, but you know, he, he commits to it, you gotta give him that. Once upon a time, he rode a horse up some stairs, killed a guy in his bedroom with a morning star and rode the horse out the window into the ocean. That was that was a good thing that happened there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Windows 95? Let's talk about that. <laughs> that from was a Braveheart. big deal. I, yeah, I know that's... Okay, so bringing this, home with something super so exciting. This was a pop culture event. Uh, the whole, the true, migration to Windows 95. It was. It, was a, it was a TV topic. It was a news topic. It was in every magazine everywhere. The whole world was migrating at once. All of our PCs were simultaneously obsolete. You needed... They said you needed an eight, but you really needed at least 12 megabytes of RAM to run 95 and programs reliably. Uh, it's back then, PC. believe it or not, on well, it was a big deal. Believe it or not, younger people, <laughs> that was a massive, massive jump that was just like unaffordable for many, many people. But yeah. three huge effects on gaming. Uh, first, it forced most people to have penny up adoption, which yep. led to better games. Second, it integrated the TCP IP stack into the OS. What that means, guys, is the internet was built into the operating system, which before that didn't exist. That meant network gaming on a LAN or the internet was easier than it had ever been before. Third, it was the beginning of DirectX, really, and DirectX yeah, adoption, and DirectX which is, that's X Xbox for which Xbox is named. Is named. Right, right. Yeah. all three of those things, really big deals. Also, the only operating system to ever ship with Buddy Holly's Weezer video on the desk. <laughs> Weezer's Buddy Holly video. Buddy Holly's, Important ooh. differentiation. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so I remember actually I was I had a I had a Mac. I went I went to uh, uh, I went to school in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is a, I felt like a very Mac heavy area, kind of like like Berkeley, a lot of snobby tech people. <laughs> and I remember up until Windows ninety five dropped, you could get Mac games. Like that was mm -hmm. the thing that was out there. That was just doable. They were they were fine for that. And then suddenly it was like that does doesn't that's not really a thing anymore. That kind of stopped. Pretty much people just started making. Windows games, you know? It was such a high adoption rate that it was difficult. It was so tempting for them. It was so easy to do. Also, when Jobs came in not long after that, he was kind of a notorious stickler about not liking games on the Mac, and that didn't help either. For that doing job. your homework. But, yeah. For getting your homework it's done. getting that homework done. It's important stuff. It's for those important businessy tasks for making the money. Well, yeah. it's so funny because I do feel like 1995 was sort of the start of the internet being in everyone's home. Because of Windows 95, I mean, I remember getting wanting AOL mm -hmm. yep. in 1995 because WWF had their website that had gone up that year, and now you had a computer <laughs> that could connect. Just go to www.wwf.com. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that was pretty much it, and it took like ten minutes to get onto AOL. It made all those uh, sounds. Do 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 do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I wake my parents up at two in the morning, sneaking downstairs to play on the internet, and you could not miss that thing. But it, oh, yeah. it, it, that gave us Windquake, and Windquake uh, was the gateway to first-person gaming on the internet. Yeah. And uh, oh, that's true after that, it was there was just no rolling it back. Multiplayer gaming went from something you did on one television, sitting side by side with a friend, to something that. Most of the time, you did in front of your own screen with other people in other buildings. Also, what can't be underestimated about Windows ninety five is that you know while while Windows three point one before it was uh, definitely a step in that direction, like Windows ninety five was like the was the moment where where the visual interface uh, that that way of organizing and interfacing with the computer became like one hundred percent the standard. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like in three point one, it was like you know command prompt still had like some degree of like. Real use, yeah, yeah, you yeah. could use it in 95, you could call it 95 and it was still, it still did things. And certainly there, there are people who would prefer to use, uh, you know, command prompt to get around their computer, but like that was, that was the moment when visual interfaces, I feel like, just exploded. Absolutely, well, 3.1 three, three was, was a things. utility and 95 yeah. was really the other way around. That command yeah. prompt was kind of fooling you. I remember yeah. going to friends' houses and trying to play games on their 3.1 computers and someone's dad had to come downstairs and help us figure <laughs> yeah. it out. Right. Like it was like parents help you set it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> on that note, 
This was supposed to play Kiss from a Rose, but apparently my phone's on silent, so oh, I apologize. No. Oh, no. Uh, Batman Forever also came out in 1995, and it's not as bad as people say it was. <laughs> um, mm. We should wind things down. Um, there are more years to cover in History of Awesome. Uh, what? Let's go around quick. What is your personal favorite thing we didn't talk about from 1995, off the top of your head? Um, I think the thing from 1995 that we didn't talk, we touched on it, but we didn't talk about it, was uh, was Battle Arena Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> You, I played that game so What's wrong so with hard. you? <laughs> I played it so hard, Max. I loved it. I was like, this is the future of fighting games. Okay, I, actually, I actually liked it too. I'm just yeah, sorry. I loved it. I played it so much. Such silly uh, voice clips for, for, the different, uh, for, the different, uh, for the different moves. The, the whip lady. Aurora Revolution. I was like, oh my god, this is the coolest thing ever. Like, I, lo- I, loved, I loved that. And Jumping Flash, my two favorite uh, launch games for the, uh, for the PlayStation. Right, Megan? Sailor Moon actually came out in America in 1995. Good it debuted answer. in Japan in 1993. But I remember Deke brought it over about 1995, and that was my gateway into anime. Deke move. <laughs> 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 I love, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, very partial to the, just the American butchering of Sailor Moon. Oh, mm. man, it is. It is a slaughterhouse. And yeah. I loved it at the time, even though it made no sense. Yeah. Jared? My burgeoning high school romance. That was definitely my favorite part of 1995. Uh, was that like a DOS game or something? <laughs> no, no, that was, that was actually real life. I was going to say, what platform is that for? <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to say Hackers. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Hackers is Yeah, really Hackers good. is just my favorite. It's just, I remember seeing, I remember being like eight years old and seeing a poster for it and being like, this sounds cool. <laughs> I don't know what hacking is, but I know it's a cool idea. And they had like the some neon skull or something for the logo. And... Then I think I saw it when it was on cable, and I was like, I don't know if I like this. But it was one of those movies that just stuck with me, mm. and I've gone back and watched it probably several dozen times since then because it's just so tremendously, amazingly, wonderfully bad. And I think, uh, like, to your point, though, about, like, looking at it and being like, this is something I want to be about. It's like, sometimes it's not the characters. Sometimes it's not the the writing. Sometimes you a, a movie or presents a world to you that, especially at a specific point in, in your life, you're like, yeah. That's the world for me. <laughs> People like me belong there. I want to have spiky hair like that guy in Chrono Trigger. <laughs> <laughs> I rollerblade everywhere. Everyone will think I'm so cool in my wraparound <laughs> Oakleys. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much for joining us. 1995 was a wonderful year. Um, Vince, Megan, Jared, thank you for joining us. And uh, we'll be back next time in 1996. Hack the Gibson. Hack the world. <laughs>